Um, put your put your thumb there, Judges 16, and we're going to flip over to Proverbs 5, and we're going to start there. Proverbs 5, verse 1. Proverbs 5, verse 1. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding, that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of the immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable, and you do not know them. Therefore hear now, my children, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your, uh, and your years uh, to the cruel one, lest the aliens be filled with your wealth and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed and say, how I, hate it, how I have hated instruction and my heart despised correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to those who instruct me. Uh, it was on the verge of total, I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly and the congregation. You can almost hear <clears throat> Samson's father giving him this very advice early in Samson's life, early in the story. And Samson taking the stand that I must have for a go-getter for me as we saw in chapters 14 and 15 of Samson's early life. There's another proverb that says, <clears throat> whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Uh, we're going to jump right into Judges 16. To continue our story of Samson. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. When the Gazites were uh, told Samson has come here, they surrounded the place, lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying in the morning when uh, it is daylight, we will kill him. Samson lay low till midnight. When he rose at midnight, took hold of the doors, of the gates of the city, and the two gateposts had pulled them up, bar and all, um, put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. We'll stop there for a moment. We start this whole sort of um, what we call chapter, what, what the chapter breaks are man-made, so you're, you're entering in sort of another phase of Samson's life with the story of him going to Gaza, and it opens with Samson in Nazarite but before birth, a man, a man with a call on his life before he was even born to live a Nazarite life committed to the things of the Lord um, for the purpose of delivering his um, people from the Philistines. And so he goes down to Gaza, which is one of the, uh, is the southernmost of the five big Philistine cities to see a harlot there. And, and you go, what is Samson? A man with a call in his life set apart for the work of God doing in Gaza, chasing after a harlot. And this is the pattern of Samson's life. That Samson is seeking his carnal living, a carnal life, seeking after his flesh, seeking after what pleases him. And, and not walking the path that the Lord had set before him. So the Gazites were told Samson was in the city, and that was a big deal. Samson had a reputation, and his reputation was probably primarily around destroying all their crops early on with fire and, uh, um, and, and really bringing hunger to many of the cities and in, to their area. And so he, was, uh, he, he had a reputation. They found out he was in the city. He said, all right. We're going to surround the city tonight and we're going to capture him as he comes out in the morning 
And, and there's all kinds of problems. You can read commentaries about this, uh, just this one little passage till you're sort of sick of it. Uh, uh, analyzing every bit of the story of how could they surround the city and how could they not see him leave and how could they not capture him when he was trying to pull the city gates up and how could he carry these gates and how is this possible and how is that possible? And if you're just looking for reason to doubt the story, there's plenty of reason to doubt it. But man, that's what the scripture tells us. And that they surrounded the city and they were at the gate and, and he must have went and he went out obviously before they were expecting him. How does a man lift these gates? He doesn't lift them of his own strength. And so what we see is an exercise of the strength that God has placed in his life. So it's a strength that God has put in his life for, for the Lord's purpose. But he's using this strength for his own purpose, his own ways. Using it in just his whole life is, um, is lived for his own personal desires and pursuing what pleases him. The strength is incredible to think of these gates. These gates were not a little small garden gate. These were a set of gates with gate posts and, and a bar that would have held them all together, that would have stabilized them together. And to, to take these things out of the ground and put them on your shoulder, at, at any point to put them on a shoulder and walk with them on a shoulder is incredible. Why did he walk and tear the gates out and walk, not just escape? Uh, to taunt the Philistines, to show his strength, to, uh, I don't know. A and that he carried them to the hill that faces Hebron. Hebron was 40 miles away. Uh, if there was a hill nearby that faced Hebron, I mean, maybe there was a hill. It, it, the trip to Hebron was 40 miles all uphill. As if going, carrying gates for 40 miles downhill would be much easier. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's kind of a, it's kind of a moot point. You tore these gates up and you're carrying this as a show of incredible strength. And whether you carried them 40 miles or 20 miles or a mile, it is a display of God's strength in his life and how he's misused um, this strength. Uh, this is, uh, uh, over and over again, we see um, this in his life. He is, he is a one-man wrecking crew. And, and he uses this so frivolously, like it's a big joke, right? That his strength is available to him anytime he wants it, and he can use it to make mockery of the Philistines. And it's a really a misdirected might. And the only thing he's really wrecking is his own life, his own call. We'll talk about that more. Verse 4, afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. <clears throat> and the lords of the Philistines came uh, up to her, and they said to her, entice him and find out where his great strength lies and by what means he may overpower him, uh, that we may bind him to afflict him, and, and every one of us will give you 1,100 uh, pieces of silver. So Delilah comes into the scene. Sorek was a little bit closer to his own area between Dan and, and sort of this area between uh, where Dan had populated and, and Judah, uh, more around his home uh, uh, where he grew up and not necessarily in the Philistines' territory, at all, although it was still very near. Uh, it, there's, there's lots to read about the name of Delilah. You can read everything from Delilah was uh, meant uh, of the night. Delilah meant delight. Delilah meant uh, uh, a burden on you or something along those lines. I mean, you could, you could kind of find whatever meaning you choose in her name, depending on the influence of the languages around whether you believe Delilah was uh, Philistine, whether she was um, Hebrew or whatever she was. She was definitely for sale is what she was. And so that uh, she was in at least in, um, uh, in cahoots with the Philistines, that they would come and entice her. They knew that they could, she had a price, they enticed her. And uh, with 1,100 pieces of silver. Uh, the, the pieces of silver is a, it is a 
italicized in mine. I don't know what yours might say if you have a different translation. But it's 1,100 silver is what it says. So we don't know the denomination. It could be like $11. <laughs> could be $1,100. It sort of presents it like if this is a great amount of wealth. But we really don't know because we don't know the denomination of these pieces of silver. But um, for each of the uh, five to present her with this must have been enough to entice her <clears throat> to, uh, to try to trick her lover into revealing this secret. Verse 6, so Delilah uh, said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you might be bound to afflict you. So Delilah doesn't, she must be, uh, must have been a real thinker. Um, she decided just to go the direct route and not try to fool him. And you look at this and you go, either Delilah was a dim wit, Samson was a dimmer wit, <laughs> and the two deserved each other. I, I don't know. Because she's just straight up. She says, tell me what's the source of your strength so, so we might be able to bind you and, and to afflict you. And so there was really just no need for a, sod, a facade because, honestly, Samson just thinks that it can't happen to him and that uh, it's a joke. And he uses this great strength uh, without respect for it, without honor and reverence toward the source of it. And, uh, and so this is round one of Delilah's effort. Um, and Samson, verse 7, uh, said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So uh, bowstrings were um, quite possibly made of uh, tendons of a dead animal, which would have been a, another violation of, of uh, inviting another violation of his Nazarite vow. Um, having a green, sort of green or fresh uh, tendon was, uh, would still have its strength in it. And, um, and so those, that's what they would made bowstrings of in many occasions, not all. Um, that, that, and notice that it's, it's to bind him, uh, that the bowstrings don't bind him and, uh, and keep his strength at bay, but that it's presented as it removes his strength. And so this is a presentation of sort of this magic. And so there's a, this idea of, of uh, uh, quite possibly in their culture, of this sort of a magic that would be applied to him, that it was seven bowstrings, well, six wasn't eight, but seven of these bowstrings uh, would, done this way, would bind him and remove his strength. Uh, uh, and it, it really is indication that almost a, 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 con a conceding effect that they could not overcome the strength of the Lord that was in his life. That they could not, that there was no way that this strength could be overcome, but that strength had to be removed. And how was it removed? It, it wasn't removing God from Samson's life, but removing Samson from God and moving Samson's life into a different place. And he was a willing participant of this. And this is the story of our lives. And it's like every one of us could go, yeah, I've been Samson. That we've removed ourselves because we've chased after that flesh and that carnal desire and the thing that felt good. And this is what the world tells us to do constantly. And in doing so, we've removed ourselves from the relationship and the presence of the Lord. We become that willing participant that goes down that road and, and then our strength is gone. Verse 8, so the lords of the Philistines, they, they brought up to, um, to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and, and she bound him with them. And, and now men were lying in wait, uh, staying uh, with her in the room. And she said to them, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings and, and as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was what was not known. 
Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you, what you may be bound with. And I just can't imagine Samson would say, I mocked you. You had dudes in the other, the other room ready to call me off and tie me up. And, <laughs> and uh, these two desert each other, as I said. But it's a game. Samson's playing a game. He thinks he can't lose. There's no honor among thieves. Delilah is offended that he would have lied to her even though she has lied and mocked him. Round two, verse 11. So he said to her, if they bind me securely with new ropes, again, this idea that they were new ropes, and this, this, this may be another sort of indication of some mojo, some, some um, taunting them with their own sort of perceived magic that if they could use these new ropes, it would perform some magic to bring his, um, uh, bring his strength uh, to nothing. And so if they uh, bind me securely with new ropes that, that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took on new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And men were lying in wait, staying in the room, but he uh, broke them off of his arms like a thread. Delilah said to Samson, Until you now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what may be bound, what you may be bound with. I would think at least after one round one, Samson would have got caught on. After round two, Samson would have said, hey, this is not going to end well. It's time to separate myself from the situation. But his eyes weren't open to that. There was a blindness, a blind spot in Samson's life, a blind spot that he, uh, he dabbled with and did not recognize it as a blind spot. Round three. And he said to her, if you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, and so she wove it tightly uh, with the batten of the loom, and said to him, the, the Philistines upon you, Samson, but he woke from sleep and he pulled out the batten um, and the, uh, from the web and from the loom. And so the, this this loom, or what have or what it would have looked about, it was something set up on the ground with with stakes in the ground, and and the, what would have been established the warp and the woof of the of the was all done on the ground with sticks and stakes. I guess is maybe a better a better term uh, to establish where they would. So we change them first of every month. And they just don't seem to be lasting as long, but we're getting a really good price for them. <laughs> so the loom was a, a established uh, on the ground. That was what it uh, would have been established. And so he would have somehow, she is getting him to lay down. She's weaving his locks into this, into this loom, which would have been kind of interesting because just sort of the hair, uh, the, the hair, Thing was even something you could read about. It was very normal to have their hair grown long in this situation. It would have been separated into, you know, these maybe seven braids. You know, I sort of think like seven braids down the center, like you have a <laughs> mohawk or something, but I don't know. Um, but that was sort of normal. Uh, and so he would have had just um, a small number of very long braids in his long hair. 
that would have made it very easier, very much easier to weave into this. But he just stands up, pulls this whole thing out of the ground. It's all hanging from his hair, from his head, and uh, <clears throat> and makes a joke of of this, and again mockery of the Philistines, which is probably great fun to him. But it's not what God intended for him to use this strength for. And then she said to him, how can you, verse, verse 15. Then she said to him, how can you uh, say I love you when your heart is not with me? What a strange irony. Because isn't this the Lord's word to Israel? Didn't the Lord say to Israel, how can you say you love me when your heart is not with me? And Samson is, is playing this role that he's sort of standing as a, as a representative of all of Israel. Fooling around with foreign gods, fooling around with everything and all the cultures around them with no commitment and no dedication to follow after what he has called them to do as their God. They're dabbling with all this other stuff. And so what a great irony that this this, this woman, this, however you want to classify her, she was for sale. She was a liar and a mocker and, and, and she was a user and abuser and, and why he is dabbling with her is uh, beyond comprehension. But she says the greatest wisdom of all, how can you... How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and, and have not told me uh, where your great strength lies. And it came to pass, verse 16, when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death, that he told her all his heart when he said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head. For I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. This is, this is round four. And honestly, it's just, I don't believe that Samson thought that that was really true. I think he presented this just like the others. He was a Nazarite. He's getting closer and closer to the truth. But honestly, I think Samson was so frivolous and, and irreverent about it, I think he thought, even if he shaved his head, that it wasn't going to affect the strength that he had. I don't think he thought it would change anything. But in fact, the shaving of the head was the final act of the vow. It was closing the vow out. And Samson was a Nazarite for life, and his vow was to be closed out with death. It was not closed out by the removal of his hair like a normal vow would be. When Delilah saw that <clears throat> he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of Philistines saying, come up uh, once more for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of Philistines came to her and brought the money in their hand because it's about the money. And she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and he said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. One of the saddest lines in the scriptures. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. How could he not have known that that day was near? He just thought it would go out as any other day. That today would be like yesterday and tomorrow will be like today. And that things would never change and that you could go through life having his way, chasing after the things that he felt important, 
ignoring the call upon his life, the strength that the Lord had given him to use for his glory. And there he stood. The Lord had departed from him. Verse 21, Then the Philistines took him, and they put out his eyes. And they brought him down to Gaza. And uh, they bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. This is where, this is really goes back to that proverb that we started with, but this is where your sin takes us. This, this is where the sin of his life delivered him to, that it, it was always, always from the beginning when he disregarded that Nazarite vow, that that sin always had a price and it was always leading him to, to destruction in this way. And, and this is the enemy's work. And so uh, uh, Samson lived with a blind spot. He lived with a spiritual blindness. And, and the fact that the first thing he did was to put his eyes out is very telling because now he's living in the darkness. And, and that darkness, the physical darkness that he would live in, would match the, the spiritual darkness that he was always walking in. And so his eyes were put out. And, and then they bound him uh, with bronze fetters. He'd never been bound that way. And then he was taken to become a grinder in the prison, which is normally a, a chore for an animal, uh, an oxen. And so he was attached to, uh, uh, to a grindstone and, and forced to blindly walk in circles and turn a grinder and... Uh, and this is what his calling had come to. This is where his sin delivered him to. Some, some um, bring this point, and it's really it's a, because it makes it memorable that sin brought him to blinding and binding and grinding. And, uh, and it's so true. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer, I guess I'll miss 22, verse 22. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, <clears throat> their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. And so to say, Dagon, our great God, um, they offer this great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and, and is to say, our God is greater than Yahweh, and that uh, they have delivered our enemy Samson, the tool of Yahweh's uh, deliverance. They've, del they've uh, conquered him, which is a way of saying they've conquered God. And our God is greater than th their God. And they were having a great celebration. So this is now no longer about Samson. And they've now made it about Yahweh. It's dangerous ground for them. They, uh, Samson, uh, in the background, uh, grinding in his blindness with his hair growing. Uh, is sort of the presentation as they celebrate this. Thinking that, uh, this man could never be used by God again because his eyes have been removed. His, his strength is bound. He's in bronze fetters. The reason he was never bound before is because nobody could ever get him to that point. But even if he had strength, he could never break the bronze fetters. He could never um, do any good with his eyes blinded in that way. And that he was a toy, uh, a, uh, a sort of a... Uh, a, a um, emblem of their uh, sort of conquering uh, and oppressing Israel. And so he is emblematic of their success. And so they, they celebrate him in this way. When the people saw, verse 24, when they saw him, they praised their God, for they said, our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land. Remember, he burned their crops and burned their groves and all of that. And, uh, and the one who multiplied our dead. So he destroyed their land, not to mention he tore their gates up, probably made them mad. 
And he is the one that multiplied the dead. And uh, they weren't used to anybody being able to do that. So verse 25, so it happened when their hearts were merry um, that they said, call Samson that that he may perform for us. Um, This is probably blind man games. It's great fun. Um, Blind man games is is uh, is probably slapping the blind man and or, uh, and seeing if he can figure out who slapped him and from what direction they were coming and putting things in front of the blind man that caused him to stumble. It was great fun and great great uh, entertainment for the groups that the blind man would run into things and cause lots of giggles among the crowd. And so Samson was called to perform for this um, big crowd and became the entertainment. So they called for Samson from the prison, performed for them, and they uh, stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel uh, the pillars which support the temple so that I may lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. About 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. You get the picture. 3,000 people on this roof having a great feast, a great party, celebrating Dagon, mocking Samson, mocking Israelites, mocking Yahweh. Samson positioned between two pillars. Verse 28, then Samson called to the Lord saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first time we've seen in the scriptures Samson called upon God. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first time that he actually humbled himself and called upon God. It had to be blinded and bound and, and doing the work of an animal before he had the mind to call upon God. Men, we sometimes are stupid that way. I mean, we just, we, we'll talk about this more in a minute. And, and, and it's, it's all of this. We all got a little Samsonism. They don't make it just about men, but, but there, there's definitely um, part of that that we men need to consider. That we rely on our own strength, our own thoughts, our own ways. And then sometimes we need to be brought all the way down to the bottom before we get to that place where we can call out to Him. God, they call out to God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines from my eyes. There's still a personal aspect of, of His crying out to God. He knows God is the source of strength. And he knows God is the only answer that He has at that moment in time. There's nowhere else for Him to go. There's no hope of any other kind of life. And he knows that crying out to God is the right thing to do, but he's still doing it for sort of his personal vengeance for his own eyes. There's still sort of a personal part of this where he's seeking his own way, but God grants it. Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against one, uh, against them, one on the right, the other on the left. You picture the temple, right? You picture some big monument and their pillars were like very, they were very close together. They were, this is what was holding up the sort of the roof and this was where um, this upper level where there would have been air moving, would have been, cooler in the hotter part of the days. It would be a great party, a great crowd up there. This grinding is going down uh, probably in this sort of area where they can look down upon and see this entertainment. And um, to upset these pillars, they would have sat on sort of a base stone. And sometimes these pillars were stacks of multiple stones, but at least had a base stone and then a pillar and then sort of a capstone on top of that pillar. <clears throat> and it would have been just one right after another. So 
<clears throat> this is not uh, in any way far-fetched to for uh, a great strength to press these pillars up and then really then it would just fall like a house of cards. And so he says to the Lord to remember, he braces himself against this one on the right, one on the left, verse 30. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, which is, again, is, is a total, complete commitment to doing this. This is, again, you look at Samson's life, you go, tell me another time he was completely committed to anything other than his pursuit of his own fleshly desires. There's no indication he was ever committed to anything that way. But this time he is totally committed to the destruction of the Philistines. And again, with this sort of flavor of his own personal vengeance against them. He pushed with his own might, all of his might, and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. And so the dead that, uh, that he killed at the death, at his death, were more than he had killed in his life. Verse 31, And his brothers and all his father's household came down and they took him and they brought him up and they buried him between Zorah and Esh Eshtel in the tomb of his father, Manoah. And he had judged Israel for 20 years. I was reading something this week that talked about Samson being the great hero of the Israelites in the tribe of Dan. It was just like, how could the tribe of Dan make him a great hero? And I guess it was because he finished what they would have said he finished well. That he took, they judged for 20 years and he took 3,000 with him, killing more Philistines in his death than any time in his life. I think more telling of this passage is not that he judged for 20 years and that, that somehow made him sort, some sort of success. And I honestly don't think that finding him in the book of Hebrews would say, well, we got to look at him as success because he's in the Hebrew Hall of Faith. I think he's in there for a lack of opportunity. I think he's a display of what could have been by the power that God had put in his life and the strength that he'd given him. I think he's on display as what a man could have had with faith in his life to do what God had called him to do. I think he's an example of missed opportunity. But honestly, I think the, the more prominent part of that last verse is he was buried between Zorah and Eshtal. Zorah means a place of trouble, and Eshtal means a woman's request. He was buried between a place of trouble and a woman's request. That's the story of his life. That's right where he lived his life. Not on the path that the Lord had called him to. Remember the riddle? What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson found out over and over. And he toyed with that. It's that adulterous woman that he so enjoyed to be around. That her lips dripped like, like honey and that, is, that her words just spoke to that carnal part of his heart. And the whole time she was dragging him down to hell. His own personal, bringing him to destruction. And I saw the news this morning where a pastor in Chattanooga had charges filed against him And uh, falling to uh, just a terrible situation. And it's his own doing. It, you know, it's, don't look at the, the females involved as the wicked ones, but it was his own wickedness, his own sinfulness that he pursued this and draw, drew uh, others into his sin, thinking that it would never catch him up. It would never, his day would never come. Proverbs 5.21 says, For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. His own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. 
he shall die for lack of instruction. And in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. Samson's life was characterized by a misdirected might, not faith. Not faith to walk the path that God had set before him, to use this strength for what God had called him to use it for. The Lord calls us to faith. He calls each and every one of us to faith. We all have a calling on our life. From before we were breathed our first breath. He made us in our mother's womb. He created us for a purpose, for his glory. And he's placed a calling in each of our life. And when we come to the Lord and come to our faith, he, he equips us and fills us with his spirit and gives us a ministry within the church. Let me ask you can, you, can you articulate the call that the Lord has placed on your life? Can you quickly say, this is what God made me for. This is what God made me for. And so many struggle and so many in the church cannot even come close to articulating that. Been waiting for years to discover it. And, and, and the most time it's a, it's a preservation of our own sort of, we'll call it pride, or, or protecting our heart, and not wanting to step out and say, well, I'm not, I don't really know how to do that. And I don't really feel comfortable. But who said that you were called to comfort? And, and to something that you're going to know how to do and something that you're not going to fail at? You're going to fail. God doesn't say you're going to call on you to perfect success and a perfect path and you'll feel warm and fuzzy and write Hallmark cards in your spare time. Life's hard and it's ugly out there. But if you're not called and called to do something about it and speak into it, who's going to speak into it? But look around us, it's coming down. Who's got the words to speak? Who's, who's got the heart to speak into this culture? To speak into this younger generation that is being led down a path <clears throat> by these we wicked and evil people. And we're watching it happen. It's not too late. <clears throat> it's not too late to turn towards the Lord and to commit yourself completely and wholly to Him. Now, I'm not, call I'm not calling you to commit yourself to anything to this church, to any, any ministry here. I just want you to, I just want you to be committed completely to the Lord at His complete disposal, like coin in His pocket, to be spent how he chooses. Jesus gave his life for you. And it is a right response to give him your life. The Lord wanted Samson to see his weakness and his frailty and in contrast to his strength. That God gave him this great strength and, and he felt that strength uh, somehow was an offset to all of his other junk in his life that he never understood that was a weakness. And that to confess that weakness and say, God, use your strength through me and through my weakness. And who would get the glory? God would get it all. Instead, he lived his frivolous life in the spiritual blindness and chasing after his carnal things. God has given you a strength. The Bible says all the way through it about this strength that he has given in your life. A strength to walk, a strength to have faith, a strength and a power by the Holy Spirit that is in you. And we could just, you could go on and on and on, but the, the, the scripture just talks about this strength that we have. This might that we have to love, to minister, to serve, to witness, to build, to pray, show compassion. Speak into someone's life. When do we stop making excuses? Look at me. When do we stop making excuses? Is the misdirected might okay in our life?
Look, ain't none of us spring chickens in it. Well, there's a couple really young ones. There. There's at least one really young one in here. But if you don't do it for anything else, do it for the little ones. Do it for our grandkids. Most of us are up there in years. It's not time to lay down and retire. God has given you life experience and wisdom. Finishing well is important. Be used up, fall across the line with nothing left. Leave it all here. You can't take it. It's never too late to repent, to trust, to walk in faith. Don't wait for some later that's never going to come. Don't say, well, I'll be committed later when it's more convenient, when I have more time, when it fits my life better, when I'm done having my fun. The enemy won <clears throat> many victories in Samson's life, not by removing the strength of the Lord, but by removing Samson from that strength, from that commitment. And Samson's life would have been characterized by a me-centered life, ruled by his carnal nature, disregarding his call, his parental guidance, God's guidance to his ethics and morals, among other things. Samson would have fit right in our culture and been celebrated. I read a warning that I it really kind of grabbed me and I wanted to share it. It's from one of the commentaries. Passage is a warning to us concerning what characteristics we should not want in our lives. In Samson, Israel has a judge who determines what is right and wrong purely based on his senses. Today we are encouraged to live life in this way. We are persuaded by commercials to just do it. That if we like something, just go for it. Ads are directed to our senses. Appeal or appearance is everything. If you don't have the right stuff, you're nothing. Sex is used to sell everything from cars to ice cream and even rice. Samson lived in a, fa in a fashion that our culture would endorse, and at least in his willingness to gratify every inclination of his heart. And we call him a man of God. Man, that, that can't be us. And man, it's... it's it's we who are to set the pace. We are to set the pace for this. We are to lead our families. It, it's all too often in, in, in the church, not talking about this church necessarily, but it's a shoe fit thing. All too often, men sit on the sidelines. The women are the spiritual leaders. The family is committed to uh, many, many things that are not involved with following after the Lord. And then there's a constant complaint about the kids and their grandkids, about their lives and the things that are going on. And all they're doing is following our example. If your kids grow up to be just like you, are you going to complain about it? Man, it's not too late. It's kind of a heavy ending. I'm feeling it too. I'm just not putting this on everyone else. When my grandfather died, it may, he meant so much to me. Many of you heard me talk about him before. He's a crusty old farmer working hard all his life. But on Sunday morning, he was in church. On Sunday morning, when I was a little kid, fidgeting in the pew, trying to sit still, I saw my grandpa standing up front, and he looked sharp in a suit. He cleaned up good. And he stood up there as a deacon, as an elder, and he prayed, and he served communion, and he watched over people in the church. And so I grew up and I saw my grandfather that way. And when he passed away, 
It's like the Lord whispered in my ear, who's going to fill those shoes? Because it's not you. Not with life that you're living. And it was a defining moment in my life when I suddenly realized it was exactly right. I was living a Samson life. And God said, who's going to fill those shoes? Who's going to come in behind that man? We see the whole generation of those people of that character passed away. And are you raising up someone to fill your shoes? Are you walking in shoes that you would want filled? Let's bow our heads.